is our uh, uh, inspira inspirational talk uh, host Mr. Brazil Dutta is New York's MTA first director of sustainability. He has pioneered the concept transit avoided carbon, which can generate substantial revenues to pay for cities to become smart. He's leading the project MTA Solar to install acres of solar panels on bus depot and train shed roofs in New York City State, which when realized, it can be one of the largest installations of its kind. He was Written, he has written and lectured extensively on transit avoided carbon, including the UN, Harvard, Yale, and Columbia. He is the chair of Sustainable Development Commission of the UITP. He studied at MIT, and he is also an Indian contemporary art lover. Please welcome with a, a warm welcome to Brazil Data. Thank you, Christina. Uh, Namaskar. Christina introduced me as, yes, here. Although Christina introduced me as a New Yorker, and I am indeed a New Yorker, but I grew up in Delhi, and I came to Jaipur for the first time in 1976. In 1976, most of you had not been born, and Jaipur was about 46 square kilometers. Today, it is about 460 square kilometers. It has grown 10 times. The hosts, the organizers who are organizing transportation, told me that I should leave here at 6 for an 8 o'clock flight. That's because the traffic is going to be very bad. And Jaipur is not a very large city. It's going to take maybe an hour plus to get from here to the airport. That's because Jaipur has the highest rate of vehicle ownership in India. There are about 470 cars or two-wheelers for every thousand people. This is a problem. This is not very smart. Standing around, sitting in traffic, sitting inside your car is not very smart. So, the question is, what is a smart city? What makes a city smart? Is it just technology, which of course there has to be a lot of, or is it city form? And what does city form come from? Does it come from history, like Jaipur's incredibly historic and, and well-designed core? Does it come from geography, because you have a river or a hill or something? Does it come from pathways and mobilities and streets and so on, and does it come from technology? So I won't have good answers to all these questions today, but I'm going to ask these questions and maybe help you arrive at some of the answers. There is an automatic linkage between smart city and modernity. Is that justified? Is every aspect of smart, does it need to be new? Or can there be smartness to be learned from the old city, especially in a place like Jaipur? Is smart mobility only for the greater good? Is it only for the city or should we be doing it for ourselves? And how can we get from here to the smart city? So these are some of the questions that I will be asking. And here is some data to start the, the conversation with. These are four countries, India, China, Germany, and the US, and the orange uh, if I can find the clicker, the orange slice, which says 40% for the US, is the energy spent on transportation. For India and China, that's about 10%. For Western Europe, it's about 25%. And for the US now, it's actually even more, about 43, 44% of all the energy is spent in transportation. If you look at India and see how much energy it uses per capita, it's, this is actually a unit that is used in the United States, British Thermal Unit, MBTU, but it's very close to the Joule. So it's 23 for India, 72 for China, three times, 160 for Germany, and 285, almost two times the amount of energy consumed by an average American is consumed by uh, an average German, is consumed by an average American. So as a country like India develops, you can say you need more energy because this country is developing. 
but Germany is actually more developed than the US and uses half the energy and it does so because of it's smart in the way people live. In the United States, these are three states, California, Texas and New York. If you see the energy consumption for the entire country and see what it is for these three states, New York is 185, California is 200 and then look at a state like Texas. Again, this is related to habitation patterns. The city of New York where I live, that actually, that number is almost one quarter of the national average because people don't drive so much, they take public transportation, they walk, they bicycle, etc. So the close link between city form and smartness. Here are two buildings or one million square feet of office building. One of them is in a tower in, in the middle of Manhattan and the other is an office park in the suburbs. So here everyone walks or takes the subway or the metro and here everyone basically drives a car. So we did some energy analysis on these two buildings and as it turns, this is, these are screenshots, as it turns out on a per square meter or per square foot basis, both the buildings have pretty similar energy profiles. But when you put the transportation energy on top of that, the suburban building is much, much more energy consumptive. Somebody else did the same analysis on a per person basis rather than per square meter or square foot and they came up with the same conclusion which is transportation is where the big energy is uh, used. So, there is an automatic linkage in people's minds with a smart city has to be, every aspect of it has to be modern. Here is Jaipur. You know that the famous plan of Jaipur with the nine squares, one square is dis displaced. So this is Jaipur, the old walled city. And these are how the corridors and the streets were laid out. Some of them through streets, some of them dead end streets. And along those corridors and streets is where the density of the city emerged. And eventually that density spread over time in all of the nine squares inside the wall. And this is roughly as a consequence what it looks like today. And you can see that same pattern on the Google map. And if you zoom out even a little bit more, you can see it up there with the rest of the city. Now, the problem starts when suburban sprawl starts. And today, of course, it has gone much further than this. When automobiles become the only means of transportation and everything else sort of is completely um, jam-packed with traffic as a consequence. Whereas, the original plan of a, Japan, of a Jaipur house was very intelligent. They first built the section that faced the street and over time they built the rest with very narrow courtyards so that not a lot of heat would come in but a lot of light would come in all the way to the depth of the, the building. This was smart. Today this is the metro uh, or the metro is the pink line and everything else is proposed. And my proposal to you is Jaipur would be much smarter if some of the investments that are happening in the roads instead go towards making the second phase of the metro sooner and the, even have a third phase come in. Now, so far everything I've said has been about community, has been about cities and how cities are smart cities at the level of people. But individuals, smart city and density and using public transportation, walking and not driving is something that individuals, single human beings should care about. This is the curve of driving on top and driving per capita. It's called vehicle miles. It could be kilometers also in the US from about the Second World War to about now. This is when the Second World War finished and the US built a very famous highway system called the Interstate Highway System and the dr amount of driving started to go up. This is kind of a very recent phase of that driving and look at the geometry, look at the curves in, inside that last rectangle. It is mimicked by the obesity. As people drive more and more in society, the society tends to get fatter. This is the map of the US with 
showing each state and what percentage of the population is clinically obese. That was 1990, 1999, 2008, 2010. So people have been basically driving themselves, driving so much that there's no walking, there's no steps. And that's also something that could very well be the situation here if we are not careful. So at some level, it's a smart city, but also for a smart individual. This is, by the way, a map of all 50 states, uh, very clearly illustrating in the United States, very clearly illustrating the inverse relationship between driving and obesity. The states where people drive the least, they are the fittest, and vice versa. And this is for uh, European countries the, and, and the North America. And basically, you can see the, where people uh, walk and bike, they're much less obese. And finally, pictures speak louder than words. And here is a picture for you. OK. So how can we finance uh, the smart city or the journey to sort of denser uh, large infrastructure, public transportation, et cetera. And we have, at the MTA, come up with this thing called transit avoided carbon, where you can actually calculate the emissions avoided when you have good public transportation. One, of course, is a densification, that you move from lower densities of people to higher densities. The next is, um, the next is called mode shift. You go from a more carbon-intense mode to a shared platform. And then finally, congestion relief. The fact that if there was a lot of people, if there were a lot of people today, tonight in Jaipur, taking the metro back home, and if there was a much larger metro network, then the, the roads would not be so crowded. It would not take one hour or one hour and a half to go from here to the airport. And these are the avoided trips. And this is avoided trip, land use multiplier, congestion relief. You can calculate all of this. You can also calculate your own emissions as, a, as the emissions in running the system. And that's your debit and that's your credit. And by our calculation, our system avoids about 17 million metric tons of greenhouse gases. In the US right now, there is no market. Uh, there's no law or anything like that, but several other countries do, and we think someday the entire world will have a price on carbon. And if this were to happen, public transportation agencies, including the Jaipur Metro, would be able to, one of the goods and services it would sell would be avoided emissions. So I'm going to summarize and then leave you with a few pictures. So in summary, as societies develop and industrialize, their energy needs rise. So this was the India and the China going up. Transportation emerges as a major consumer of energy. The automobile-based paradigm with corollary suburban sprawl is wasteful and unsustainable. Smart cities have to embrace mass transit and support density. Designing the right financial tools can change the world. And selling transit-avoided carbon is a smart uh, thing to do and will help finance this change. Now, right at the end, I want to leave you with a few photographs, a few pictures. This is a picture from the United States in the 1950s. This was the picture of paradise. A small house with a car in the front, the boat, everything. And this was embraced not only in the US, but all over the world as the best way to go. This is how we should all live. And this was not smart at all. It created this landscape. It basically just sprawled and sprawled and sprawled and was just an animal that kept eating up everything around it. And this is very, very, we have to be very careful of this repeating itself in India. Today, however, we are fighting that last image with this image. We are saying we, this is the wrong image to be fighting that with because what this image says is, you carry on with your way of life, we will fix the problem on the supply side. Demand does not have to ch change. This is not true. Fundamentally, demand has to change. The nature. We have to reduce our uh, emissions, and, and you cannot take care of it just by doing renewable power. We should instead be fighting it with images like this of people 
of density of public transportation here in Jaipur of this is a picture of um, Lisbon I think where nice neat but everyone staying quite close to each other. Now remember I often give this or a presentation like this in the United States and in the US everywhere people live in single family houses and drive cars and they listen to this presentation and even the most sympathetic of them say okay that's great but this does not work in America. So I have to provide an example of what I think is the future sustainable smart habitation looks like in the future and actually I have an example of it in New York City there is a borough called Queens which you may have heard of some of you may have visited others may have family and relatives that stay there Queens has a lot of Indians so it also has people of many many different parts of the world living so however Queens is not very photogenic it's not very easy to make nice pictures of Queens so I give use the word queen but show maybe Freddie Mercury or the queen literally etc. But this is what it looks like. Um, it's high rise, high density um, living with the occasional pocket of low density uh, with factories still working and producing things and people existing next to each other cheek by jowl and it all happens on the back of good public transportation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fragel. Uh, we have a little bit of time for a couple of questions from the audience. If anybody would like to make any questions? Oh, there is a question there. Do we have a microphone, please? Thank you, sir. I'm H. Kumar from CST Energy and Environment Media. My point is, morning have our vice president about the liable cities program. I'm saying to the our vice president of our government of India, we have good idea. But how to make a liable if the ecological factor not increases? So how to create the low carbon cities in local areas? What should the paradigm shift where the finance is available, technology is available, IT is there, environment is there, solar energy is there, wind energy is there, where to how to remove the ecological factor for the low carbon technology and low carbon city? Sure, that's a very good question. So the first thing that you have to do is you have to reject the high carbon city. And currently in India what is happening a lot is perhaps as a generational response to living in the traditional uh, urban areas whether it is uh, the old city in Jaipur or Chadni Chowk in Delhi, the, there's a generational shift away and that shift often manifests itself in, in suburbanization. People want to live away from each other, not very close to each other. This is something that I think we will have to contest. And I think the way to do it is basically have very, very good mobility, very good networks uh, so that where there is a trunk route, there is actually a heavy rail system, but the last mile could often be some kind of e-mobility. It could be a, a bicycle sharing or small pods that go from your home to, so some kind of diffusion. But basically, we have the ingredients of a good sustainable settlement pattern in India here itself. We have to do a little bit of uncovering. We have to do a little bit of dusting. We have to modernize it. We have to infuse it with technology. But basically, Indians are quite frugal people. They can make do with less. And that is actually what is required, that quality. Any other questions? Any? Oh, there is another question here in the middle.
Hello. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Myself, Nilesh Bansal. I am from JCRC University. Sir, my question is that, uh, do you think that technology is helpful in saving environment and how it can help to save environment? Yes. So the short answer to your question is absolutely yes. But technology is a many-headed beast. There are large parts of it that will help save the environment, but then there are other parts of it uh, that are probably not so great for the environment. But fundamentally, I think what technology does is it is able to, you're able to monitor what's going on. You, are able, you know exactly how much water is flowing. You know exactly where that water is going. And your chances of being able to conserve water are better when you know it very well. So technology is an enabler. It's a tool. It will not save the water. You will have to save the water. I will have to save the water. But technology can make it apparent to us what is going on and therefore that might trigger a change that we go ahead and, and do something about it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, we don't have time for more questions, unfortunately, but thank you so much, Brazil, for being here. It's a pleasure and an honor having you with us. And let's give him a warm applause.